الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم عبس وتولى أن جاءه الأعمى وما يدريك لعله يزكى أو يذكى فتنفعه الذكرى أما من استغنى فأنت له تصدى وما عليك ألا يزكى وأما من جاءك يسعى وهو يخشى فأنت عنه تلهى كلا إنها تذكرا فمن شاء ذكره في صحف مكرمة مرفوعة مطهرة بأيدي سفرة كرام بررة قتل الإنسان ما أكفر من أي شيء خلق من نطفة خلقه فقدر ثم السبيل يسر ثم أماته فأقبر ثم إذا شاء أنشر كلا لما يقض ما أمر فلينظر الإنسان إلى طعامه أن صببنا الماء صبا ثم شققنا الأرض شقا فأنبتنا فيها حبا وعنبا وقطبا وزيتونا ونخلا وحدائق غلبا وفاكهة وأبا متاعا لكم ولأنعامكم فإذا جاءت الصاخة يوم يفر المرء من أخيه وصاحبته وبنيه لكل امرئ منهم يومئذ شأن يغني وجوه يومئذ مسفرة ضاحكة مستبشرة ووجوه يومئذ عليها غدرا ترهقها قترا أولئك هم الكفرة الفجرة بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه uh, First and foremost it's my honor and pleasure to join you today inshallah to share some words of benefit for all of us, for myself and for you, inshaAllah, for the whole family. <coughs> In the surah that I just recited, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الصَّاخَةِ يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ يَوْمَ إِذٍ شَأْنٌ يُغْنِيهِ He talks about a day a day that each and every one of us will experience, the day of judgment, the day in which that trumpet will be blown, and when that trumpet is blown, no family relation, no tie of blood will matter to anyone. Uh, the mother will not care for her daughter or her son. 
The husband will not care for his wife. The brother will not care for his sister. And so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He throws forth a picture, an image that each and every one, one of us need to understand. If I ask you what the strongest bond is, the strongest form of love, give me an example of it. You would say, that of a mother and her child. That of a mother and her child. Or a father and his son. How proud are we of our sons, right? You know, we're proud to go around saying, this is my son. My son. The son of whatever your name is. Proud. And he's going to carry on your legacy. He's going to carry on your name. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says a day is coming, a promised day. Everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised you, has it not come to pass? He told you when you think of Him, He will provide and make a way out. How many a time in your life that happened? You thought of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you bowed down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you fell in sujood to Allah azza wa jal. And from that moment, everything changed. When you were sick, because you thought of Allah, you were cured. Whereas another person who didn't think of Allah, took the same medication, did whatever he did, and he wasn't cured. So the promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always fulfilled. It's always guaranteed. And same, the same way He is promising us this day. The day where you thought you loved your children, on that day, that love won't count for anything. Rather, you will ransom your children, you will ransom your mother, you will ransom your father, you will ransom your wife, you will ransom everything in this world if you could, just to be saved from that day. So that is where I want to turn our attentions to, inshallah, that day. The Prophet sallallahu gave us another image or another picture to imagine. He said, تُدْنَ الشَّمْسُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ مِنَ الْخَلْقِ حَتَّى تَكُونَ مِنْهُمْ كَمِقْدَارِ مين. He said, the sun on that day will be brought close to the creation. The sun, as we know it will be brought so close to the creation on the Day of Judgment as you are standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the distance between the creation and the sun is like the distance of one mile. The distance of one mile. And Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, he went even further. He explains saying, I do not know if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant one mile as in the distance like we know it or meal was the, was the item he used the, the Rasul والسلام, used to call the stick that he put the guhl in his eyes so Ibn Abbas who is one of the scholars of the Quran who is going to be amongst the scholars of this ummah on that day the one most deserving to interpret the words of Rasulullah he said, I don't know which one the Prophet ﷺ meant. Was it the distance of one mile? Or the distance of that small stick that he dipped into the kuhl and put in his eyes? Just think about that for a moment. So, the sun. The distance of the sun in the creation will not exceed more than that. However you choose to, to understand it. He said, فَيَكُونُ النَّاسُ He continues, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَيَكُونُ النَّاسُ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ أَعْمَالِهِمْ فِي الْعَرَقِ Due to the sun being so close, because the sun is so close to the creation on that day. And we all know the famous hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us the feet of the son of Adam will not move, will not be able to move or flinch until he are, he's asked. He is asked about his prayers, he is asked about his, his akhlaq, his adab, his morals, his ethics, his manners. He is asked about every single moment in his life. Every second, every thought, every action, every statement. So our feet will not move. And the sun, as we know in this hadith, will, will be brought so close to us on top of our heads. And according to what we did in this life, according to our actions, we will be in sweat. We will be in perspiration. The Prophet ﷺ explained the different levels. He said some of them, they will be up to perspirations up, up until their ankles. 
and some of them will be into, into perspiration up until their waists, and some of them will be uh, uh, in, in perspiration up until their shoulders. And then he said, some of them will be drowning in the perspiration, yet they will not die. They will be drowning for a long time. The Prophet ﷺ told us in another hadith that this day can be the length of 50,000 years. 50,000 years of our lives. We live 100 years, we live 120 years and we think we've lived the life. We think we, we, we had everything, we've experienced everything. My dear brothers and sisters, a day is coming where we will look back. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, that we will look back into the life like عَشِيَةً أو ضحاها, As if the whole life that we lived, that 100 years, that 120 years, that 150 years if you had that, was as if it was one morning or one evening. As if it was one morning or one evening when we come to the realization of the reality of the Day of Judgment. So some of us will be in sweat up until our ankles, some of us will be in sweat up until our waists, some of us will be in sweat up until our shoulders, and some of us will be drowning in that sweat, yet we will not be able to die. We will continue in that moment for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees. This is the reality, my dear brothers and sisters. This is the only guarantee you have. Life is not a guarantee. We can put two people, make them healthy in the same way, give them the same lifestyle, give them the same way to live. But one may die early, one may not die. He may die later on in his life. So the only guarantee is that the death will come. That, that this day that the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam is talking about, it will come. So, n not to keep the talk morbid or, or, or you know, depressing. I'm not here to, to do that, inshallah. <laughs> We're here to get, get, get hope. But naturally, we ask ourselves after coming to this realization, coming to this truth, that that day is coming, and that day can be 50,000 years, and that day can be horrible. We can ask, I mean, we can be asked for every single thing we've done. How do we protect ourselves? And the Prophet wasallam he told us seven opportunities, seven golden gates that you can enter from to salvation. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sab'atun yudhulluhumullahu fi dhullihi yawma la dhulla illa dhulluh. There are seven individuals, seven personalities, that on the day where there's no shade, on that day where you could be drowning in your own sweat, with the shade, except for the ones who are shaded under the shade of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, These are the people who are saved. And as we go through these quickly, inshallah, I'm not, not going to make it too long, bi ta'ala. If I do feel, I mean, please do not be shy to, you know, give me that, the, <laughs> the, what's it called? The symbol, the sign. You're going too long, inshallah. <clears throat> Seven opportunities for us to attain that shade. For us to make that 50,000 years feel like it's just an hour. For us to attain the shade from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first one, the Prophet sallallahu said, Al-Imam Al-Adil. The Imam who is just. And I know the first thought that goes through our head is, Oh, scratch that. I'm not an Imam. I'm not a Shaykh. I'm not a scholar. This is actually the biggest misunderstanding. The Prophet sallallahu told us, Kullukum ra'in. Every one of you are responsible for something, someone, some person, some group of people, some way, shape, or form, you are responsible for something. And you will all be asked about that which you are responsible for. So it can, it can, it can, it can go as vast or as, as vague as being responsible for a group of people, a nation. It can go down to being responsible for a community or a city. It can go down to being responsible for a community, a faith-based community. It can be going down to being responsible as an imam, a leader, 
a, a, a khatib, for example. And it can even go for, further down. It can be simplified even more. Being responsible for your family, being responsible for your parents, being responsible for yourself. For yourself. So an Imam al Adil, the just Imam, the just leader, the just person in charge, he's deserving of the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is justice? Justice, we're talking about pure justice, not justice that is favorable in your in your uh, in your in your interest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, The extent of the justice is that you do not only be just when it's easy for you. But at the same time, when it is the most difficult for you, do not let that personal interest, that personal hurt, that personal harm, that personal headache or worry prevent you from being just. Don't let it prevent you. Rather, be just even in the hardest moment, even in the hardest situation, the hardest circumstance. Be just and that is proof that you are more conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is proof that you know Allah Azza wa Jal kana alaykum raqiba. Allah is ever watchful over you. Ever watchful over you. And the example of this is, is, is the best example I can think of actually is uh, in, the, in the time of the Khilafah of Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, in which uh, he used to employ some of the Sahaba to patrol the streets at night. And the particular Sahabi that we're talking about is uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda. He employed this man to patrol the streets at night in order to gain a better understanding of how his khilafah was. It was for him to assess himself as, as a leader. What do the people say about me? How do the people perceive me? Do they perceive me as just or do they perceive me as a tyrant, as an oppressor? Right? So, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and Umar ibn Khattab, they went together, patrolled the streets that night. And they came upon a house where all the other nearby houses were dark, but this house was lit. It was lit. In. And Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, he turns to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, and he asks, do you know whose house this is? And do you know what they're doing? And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf innocently, he says, no. I don't, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, O leader of the believers, I don't know what, the, what they're doing. Who, whose house is this? Amr al-Khattab, and this is a, a point of, like a fa'idah here, a point of benefit that we derive. Amr al-Khattab had prior knowledge. He was not assuming, he was not uh, accusing. Him as Amir al-Mu'mineen, he knew whose house it was and he knew what they were doing with prior knowledge. So he said, this is the house of so-and-so and they are inside drinking and partying. They are inside drinking alcohol and partying. So then he turned to Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he represents the policeman. Something so insignificant in society. He was not on the succession council at this time. Umar ibn Khattab appointed him to the succession council when he was dying. So this is way before that. This is when he was nothing in society. The leader of the believers turned to the policeman and said, what do you think I should do? What do you think is the right course of action at this moment? Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, he paused and he thought for a moment. You want to give the lecture? <laughs> Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, he paused and he looked at Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, and then he said, I think we will find ourselves in the description of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, وَلَا تَجَسَّسُوا وَلَا يَخْتَمْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا and Do not spy on one another, and do not uh, backbite one another. At this moment, just, just imagine the situation. The guts of the policeman to say that to the president. Imagine President Obama calls you today and says, Brother, what do you think I should do with whatever, whatever he wants to seek counsel from? The first thought in your mind is, Whoa, the president's calling me. 
I can't believe it. The president's calling me. And then the second thought is, ah, how can I say something that will impress him? How can I make him remember me for the rest of his uh, term? Right? So you'll think of anything. You'll, see, you'll use all the big words that you know just to make that impression. Even though what you're saying may not be correct, may not be authentic. This wasn't the, the way of the companions of They were imams that were adil. They were leaders that were just. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he, turned, he, he said to Abdul Mu'min that we will find ourselves as spiders and we will find ourselves as sinners. And Umar ibn Khattab, he took that advice and he walked away. He walked away. This is the justice that we're looking at, my dear respected brothers and sisters. The ulama derive from this that anything that someone does in their house, in privacy, in the nighttime, this is for them to do and for them to do alone. This is between them and their Lord. This is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is justice. It doesn't seem like Umar ibn Khattab won anything in this whole story. But that was the justice we're talking about. So can we begin to understand why this type of justice is so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will shade you on that day he will shade you on that day the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told us of six more opportunities and as we go through the rest i want you to imagine yourself standing before Allah azza wa jal and as you are standing you don't have the shade of him subhanahu wa ta'ala you don't have the shade of him subhanahu wa ta'ala Ask yourself, is this an opportunity for me? Will I be shaded because I did something like this? Was I just in my responsibilities to myself, to my family, to my community, to my Lord, to Allah Azza wa to the Deen? Was I just or did I play around? The second one, the Prophet ﷺ told us about, he said, A young boy, a youth who grew up in the worship of his Lord. Who grew up in the worship of his Lord. The Prophet ﷺ told us in another hadith, Take hold of five things before five things. And the first one, he said, عن شبابك قبل هرمك. Your youth before your old age. It is in the youth that we understand we have more energy. It is in the youth that we understand we have the will to change and amend ourselves. It is in this time that you have the ability to understand, to love, to appreciate Allah Azza wa It is in this time that you have the ability to obey Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to the utmost. You can do everything. Your body functions 100%. So we can only begin to understand that this young youth, although his father and his uncle and his parents might, might have told him, might have told him, oh, why are you praying in the masjid now? Pray when you are older. Come back. You, know, you have such a long life ahead of you. You have so much to do. Why are you growing your beard? No one's going to marry you. No one's going to like you. They're going to make fun of you. But the youth, who grew up in the worship of his Lord, who understand that he, he didn't fall prey to the peer pressure. He didn't fall prey to his friends pushing him around. He withheld. You know, uh, the, the biggest example that comes to mind is in public school, when we don't have girlfriends or we don't have boyfriends. But, I mean, I, I grew up in the public school system. I know the pressure. They make fun of you, they call you names, and they put a, a, um, like a condition, an ultimatum. If you don't get with the system, if you don't go with the flow, then you are the opposite. So you can just imagine the hardship. The one who he takes hold of, of, of his desires and pushes him down, all because he grew up in the worship of his Lord and all he desires is Allah Azza wa All he desires is Jannah, whenever Allah Azza is ready to grant it to him. That person, he is deserving of the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a day where there's no shade but the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So again, we ask ourselves, were we in our youth religious? Were we in our youth thoughtful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conscious of Allah azza wa jal every day? Did we think, what does Allah think of me in this moment and in this time? Or did we just care about creation? Did, we, did, did all we care about is makhluq? The third point, or the third individual that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises the shade of him, azza wa jal, who understand is, وَرَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ the man who his heart is always attached to the masjid. He thinks at any moment, at any time, how can I be in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How can I take my family to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He tries to fixate his entire life according to the salawat in the masjid. He tries to arrange everything that he can spend every moment in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not necessarily prank, but that he feels as if the house of Allah azza is his first home. He's more comfortable in the house of Allah azza knowing that Allah azza is there and, 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 and Allah azza is asking you to ask him. So he prefers to be there than to be even in his own home. Now in this, in this day and age, we understand that's impossible. You know, we work, we have other responsibilities, we have our children. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet they're not saying, give that up. The question is, how much do you want to be in the masjid? We understand in the example of Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala when he came to the masjid and he saw the man praying day and night in the masjid and he asked the people, how does this man make his living? They told him that his brother provides for him. His brother provides for him. Umar ibn Khattab said, his brother is better than him. His brother is better than him. Why? His brother works, his brother takes care of his responsibilities, and then he comes to the masjid whenever he can. He prays as much as he is able. His heart is attached to the masjid. If he could, if, it were, if, it, if such was the case of the life of this world, he would be in the masjid all day, all night. This is what we're talking about, my dear respected brothers and sisters. So when, when it comes to our daily lives and our doings and interactions, you know, when we come home from work, is this all we want to do, turn on the TV and kick back and relax? Or do we want to go to the masjid, read some Quran, sit in the durus of the a'imma, um, and the halaqat, and the programs? I mean, where are our hearts? Where are our hearts? The fourth one, my dear respected brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ told us about Rajulani Tahabatullah. Ijtama alayhi wa tafarraqa alayhi. About two men or two women. Two men or two women. Actually, all of these can be uh, uh, either or, a man or a woman. So, two men or two women who they love each other only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not because so-and-so has a lot of money, so let me get close to him. Not because so-and-so has the nicest car and I want to take it for a spin. Not because so-and-so has so many such, such and such degrees and, and, and achievements and masters and PhD and this, and I want to be, I want to sit with, you know, intellectual people. There's no worldly or personal benefit between these two, except that they both claim La ilaha illallah. And, the, and that is the reason they come together. Because they are Muslims. They, they say salamu alaykum to each other only because they are Muslims. They hug each other only because they are Muslims. They help each other out only because they are Muslims. They are believers. This is the only time. But the Prophet ﷺ, he went further in explaining the, the example. He said, That the reason they come together and the reason they depart it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So not only do they love, but the reason meeting with each other, the reason coming together, and the reason leaving each other, all thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask ourselves, all our parties and all our gatherings and everything that we do, even when we go to the masjid, what are we going there for? Are we going to meet our brothers and sisters in Islam? Are we going 
to meet them for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jalla, or are we going to meet them for some other worldly or personal benefit? If we are meeting them purely for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, like the Prophet Sallallahu told us, we are deserving of the shade of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala on a day where there is no shade but but His. So I want to bring you back again, bring back that picture. You are standing before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and you cannot move. And the sun is one mile away. Were you just in your responsibilities? Were you religious in your youth? Was your heart or is your heart attached to the houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did you love anyone or any group of people only because they were Muslim? Only because they were believers? They loved Allah so you loved them? We go further. The Prophet ﷺ told us of a man, and this is a very, very, uh, um, the, the picture that Rasulullah ﷺ paints here is very, very profound, very, very vivid. Um, he said, وَرَجُلٌ طَلَبَتْهُمْ رَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصِبٍ وَجَمَالٍ فَقَالَ إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهِ He said, a man or a woman that a person of the opposite gender came to him and that person of the opposite gender was of such beauty and such uh, um, good looks that he acknowledged that to mansibin wa jamal. He acknowledged their beauty and their handsomeness and their good looking. But even after acknowledging that, he said, Inni akhaf Allah. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you glance at something, when you look at something, whether, whether you're in the mall, whether you're in the movie theater, whether you're in, uh, on the street, wherever you're looking, the first thought isn't, what can I do with what I'm seeing? No, the first thought is, astaghfirullah, what I'm seeing, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Even though it is something that is pleasing to my eye, even though it is something that, that makes me happy, I don't think about the thing that makes me happy or is pleasing to my No, but I think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think about Allah azza wa How many of us, especially in the West, especially in this day and age, we have those thoughts. We have those thoughts. Those of us who do, we are deserving of the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as Allah azza wa has told us. The sixth one, my dear respected brothers and sisters, the Prophet ﷺ told us of a man وَرَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ أَخْفَى لَا يَعْلَمُ مَا تُنْفِقُ يَمِينُ بِالشِّمَالِ He did, does not know, uh, sorry, the man who he gives in secrecy, that's the first point, and then the extent of his secrecy is that what his left hand gives, or what his right hand gives, his left hand doesn't even know it. His left hand does not know what his right hand gives. Generosity. Giving fi sabilillah. This is the biggest order or the, the most repeated order from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to Ya'ir ladina amanu. Every time Allah directs something to the believers, O oh, you who believe, O oh, you who believe, O oh, you who believe in the Quran, we always, he always, or the majority of the time, he utilizes the word anfiq. Give, give, give. And he always ties belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He always ties uh, every form of struggle, every form of effort to giving fi sabilillah. Because wealth and belonging is the most prized possession of humankind. The Prophet ﷺ told us, لَوْ كَانَ لِبْنِ آدَمَ وَادِيَانِ مِنْ مَالٍ لَبْتَغَى بِهِ ثَالِثًا If the son of Adam were to be given two valleys full of wealth and belonging, his desire would not be uh, quenched there. He would desire a third valley of wealth. And he would desire a fourth and a fifth. Because nothing fills the, the belly of the son of Adam, nothing quenches that desire except dust, except being under the earth. Except being under the earth. That's where the desire will stop. Where the reality will come. So the one who he gives in secrecy, and this, and this was the practice of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu gave many times in which even his wife did not know what he was giving. Today we, we, we discuss everything with our wives. We have joint bank accounts. 
they have the, the apps on their phones where they can look up, oh, you, gave, you spent this much at Starbucks? Why are you drinking Starbucks, right? We have that, 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 that type of mentality. I mean, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he didn't have to worry about Starbucks. He gave to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And to the extent that we know in the hadith of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, uh, where Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda, he narrated this hadith, he said, for a period of time, I collected wealth and belonging. I collected with the intention that one day, I will beat Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. This is his intention, this is his thinking. One day I will give more than Abu Bakr. And I collected property and I collected wealth. So he said the Rasul والسلام, turned around one day after the Salah and he asked for donation, he fundraised. So everyone brought their portions. And Abu Bakr brought his portion. And the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he was receiving the portions, he accepted them and he accepted them until when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu brought what he had, he said something different that he didn't say to any of uh, other sahaba. He asked Abu Bakr, what did you leave for you and your family? He looked at what Abu Bakr gave him. In the realization of the amount that Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu arda gave, made him or, or wanted him to ask that question. What did you leave? I mean, you, this is everything you have. What did you leave for you and your family? And he said, I left Allah and his messenger. I left Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Just imagine. On that day, Umar ibn Khattab came to a conviction. At the end of the hadith, he said, I realize that I will never be able to be Abu Bakr. I would never be able to be Abu Bakr. When we give, the first thing, or when a fundraiser comes to our communities, the first thing we say is, another fundraiser? You know, we're, we're tired of them. And the second thing is, we start calculating, we, we look in our bank accounts and saying, oh, I can spare 50 bucks this week and give the 50 bucks. We calculate what we get. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu didn't calculate. He gave all that he had at that moment. So it's like as if you're going to your bank account and whatever you have saved, whatever you have, you take that out, you say, this is for you, Ya Allah. This is for you, O oh Allah. And I leave my family to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person, this type of individual, he is deserving of the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The last and final one, I think, Allah ta'ala alam, is the most important. He said, وَرَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا a man who he thinks of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he thinks of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, alone. And in that, uh, in that being alone, in that isolation, he begins to tear. He begins to cry. In Ramadan, in public, we cannot shed tears. On the 27th night, few of us shed tears, thinking that it's Laylatul Qadr. So what about the individual who is by himself, with his own nafs, no one pushing him, no, no external uh, factor in helping you to cry? There's only one man that comes to mind when we think of that. That's Ibrahim alayhi salam. You know, he used to cry. There's not one instance in when he used to cry for himself. When we cry, we cry for ourselves, for our health, for our wealth, for our children, for our wives, for our communities, for our masajid. We cry for our worldly lives. When we beg Allah Azza wa when we think of Allah, it is, oh, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. But the man who's deserving of the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's remembering Allah for Allah Azza wa Jalla. And in that remembrance, he begins to tear. He begins to cry. He realizes that it is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can help him. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can save him. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can provide for him. It is only Allah Azza wa Jalla who is worthy of being loved and being feared 
It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is, is worthy of being relied upon and trusted. Everything about his life becomes about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every moment, every second. As Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala, a tabi'i said, he said, there is no thought, there is no statement, there is no action, there is no step forward nor step backward except that I ask myself, will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with me? Will Allah be pleased with me? Look at the extent of his understanding of his life. No thought, no statement, no action, no step forward, no step backward, no physical movement. Except that I ask myself, will Allah be pleased with my thought? Will Allah be pleased with my statement? Will Allah be pleased with my action? Will Allah be pleased with my physical movement? This is the one who is always conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's always thinking of Allah azza wa jal. And the more you, you cultivate your heart to do that, the more you, 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 you begin to condition the heart to shed those tears when you're thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You realize that you've had it all wrong. It was always about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what, what we seek to achieve. The purpose of our existence. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us there's no other reason for you being on this earth, being in this life, except for the ibadah, the servitude, the submission, the obedience, perfect obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing else matters. All that you have been given, your intellect, your money, your influence, your status, your prestige, your honor, your respect has been granted to you in order for you to establish that ibadah and not the other way around. Allah made your lives easy so you could get closer to Him. So you could have a relationship with Him. And we'll end with that, inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to to um, shade all of us, inshallah, on the day where there is no shade for Him. Say Ameen, inshallah. Zakumullah khayru, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka, wa atubu alaykum, assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.